When uh, was Spot born? Around 2012 or so. So again, almost 10 years into sort of a run with DARPA where we built a bunch of different quadrupeds. We had a sort of a different thread where we started building humanoids. Um, we, we, we saw that probably an end was coming where the government was gonna kind of back off from a lot of robotics investment. And uh, in order to maintain progress, we just deduced that, well, we probably need to sell ourselves to somebody who wants to continue to invest in this, this area, and that was Google. And so um, uh, at Google, we would meet regularly with Larry Page, and Larry just started asking us, you know, well, what's your product gonna be? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the logical thing, the thing that we had the most history with, mm -hmm. that we wanted to continue developing was a quadruped. But we knew it needed to be smaller. We knew it couldn't have a gas engine. We, th we thought it probably couldn't be hydraulically actuated. So that began the process of exploring if we could migrate to a smaller electrically actuated um, robot. And that was really the genesis of Spot. So not a gas engine and the actuators are electric. Yes. So can you maybe comment on what it's like um, at Google with working with Larry Page, having those meetings and thinking of what are, will a robot look like that could be built at scale? What like starting to think about a product? Larry always liked the the toothbrush test. He wanted products that you used every day. Um, what they really wanted was, you know, a consumer level product, something that would work in your house. We didn't think that was the right next thing to do mm -hmm. because to be a consumer level product, cost is gonna be very important. It probably need to cost a few thousand dollars. And we were, we were building these machines that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe a million dollars to build. Of course, we were only building a two, but, mm -hmm. But we didn't see how to get all the way to this consumer level product. In a short amount of time. In a short amount of time. And he suggested that we, we make the robots really inexpensive. And part of our philosophy has always been build the best hardware you can. Make, make the machine operate well so that you're trying to solve, you know, discover the, the hard problem that you don't know about. Don't don't make it harder by by building a crappy machine. Basically, mm -hmm. build the best machine you can. There's plenty of hard problems to solve that are going to have to do with you know underactuated systems and balance. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to build these high quality machines still, and we thought that was important for us to continue learning about really what was Im the important parts of the, that make robots work. Um, and so there was a little bit of a f philosophical difference there that we. And and so ultimately, that's why we're building robots for the industrial sector now, because the industry can afford a more expensive machine because you know their productivity depends on keeping their factory going. And so, if spot costs you know a um, hundred thousand dollars or more, that's not such a big expense to them. Whereas at the consumer level, no one's going to buy a robot like that. And I think we might eventually get to a consumer level product that will be that cheap, but I think the path to getting there needs to go through these really nice machines so that we can then learn how to simplify. So what can you say to the, almost the engineering challenge of bringing down cost of a robot? So that presumably when you try to build a robot at scale, that also comes into play when you're trying to make money on a robot, even in the, in the industrial setting. But how interesting, how challenging uh, of, of a thing is that, in particular, probably new to an R&D company. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you brought that last part up. The transition from an R&D company to a commercial company, that's the thing you worry about, you know, because you've got these engineers who love hard problems, who want to figure out how to make robots work. And you don't know if you have engineers that want to work on the quality and reliability and cost that is ultimately required. Um, and indeed, you know, we have brought on a lot of new people who are inspired by those problems. But, but the big takeaway lesson for me is we have good people. We have engineers who want to solve problems. 
And, and the quality and cost and manufacturability is just another kind of problem. And because they're so invested in what we're doing, they're interested in and will go work on, on those problems as well. And so I think we're managing that transition very well. In fact, I'm really pleased that, I mean, uh, it, it's a huge undertaking, by the way, right? So you know, even having to get reliability to where it needs to be, we have to have fleets of robots that we're just operating 24 seven in our offices to go find those rare failures and, and eliminate them. It's a, just a totally different kind of activity than the research activity where you get it to work you know, the one robot you have uh, to work in a repeatable way, you know, it, it, at the at the high stakes demo. It's just very different. Um, but I think we're making remarkable progress against it. So one of the cool things I got a chance to uh, visit Boston Dynamics, and I mean, one of the things that's really cool is to see a large number of robots moving about. Because I think one of the things you, notice in the research uh, environment is the MIT, for example, I don't think anyone ever has a working robot for a prolonged period of time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so like most robots are just sitting there in a sad state of despair, waiting to be born, <laughs> brought to life for a brief moment of time. But the, just to have, I just, I just remember there's like a, there's a spot robot just I had like a cowboy hat on and was just walking randomly for whatever reason. I don't even know, but there's a kind of, a sense of sentience to it because it doesn't seem like anybody was supervising it. Well, it was just doing its I'm thing. I'm gonna stop way short of the sentience. Sure. Um, it is the case that if you come to our office you know, today and walk around the hallways, um, you're gonna see a dozen robots just kind of walking around yes. all the time. And that's really a reliability test for us. So we have these robots programmed to do autonomous missions get up off their charging dock, walk around the building, collect data at a few different places and go sit back down. And we want that to be a very reliable process because that's what somebody who's running a, a, a brewery, a factory, that's what they need the robot to do. And so we, we, have to, we have to dog food our own robot. We have to test it in that way. And um, so on a weekly basis, we have robots that are accruing something like um, 1,500 or maybe 2,000 kilometers of walking and, uh, you know, over a thousand hours of operation every week. And that's something that almost, I don't think anybody else in the world can do because A, you have to have a fleet of robots to just accrue that much information. <laughs> you have to be willing to dedicate it to, to that test. And, uh, so that's, but that's essential. That's how you get the reliability. That's how you get it. What about some of the cost cutting from the from the manufacturer side? What what have you learned from the manufacturer side of the transition from R and D to? Cover? And we're still we're still learning a lot there. Um, we're learning how to cast parts instead of instead of mill it all out of you know billet aluminum. Mm -hmm. um, we're learning how to get plastic molded parts. We're and we're learning about how to control that process so that you can build the same robot twice in a row. There's a lot to learn there, and we're only partway through that process. Um, we've we've set up a manufacturing facility in Waltham. It's about a mile from our headquarters, and we're doing final assembly and test of both spots and stretches, you know, at that factory. And um, and it's hard because, to be honest, we're still iterating on the design of the robot. As we find failures from these reliability tests, we need to go engineer changes. And those changes need to now be propagated to the manufacturing line. And that's a hard process, especially when you want to move as fast as we do. And that's been challenging. And it, it makes it, you know, the folks who are working supply chain, who are trying to get the cheapest parts for us, kind of requires that you buy a lot of them to make them cheap. And then we go change the design from yeah. underneath them. And they're like, what are you doing? And so, you know, getting everybody on the same page here that it, yep, we still need to move fast, but we also need to try to figure out how to reduce costs. That's one of the challenges of, of this migration we're going through. And over the past few years, challenges to the supply chain, I mean, I imagine you've been a part of a bunch of stressful meetings. Yeah, yeah things got more expensive and harder to get. And yeah, so it's it's all been a challenge. Is there still room for simplification? Oh yeah, much more. And you know, these are really just the first generation of these machines. Uh, we're already thinking about what the next generation of Spot's gonna look like. Spot was built as a platform. 
So you could put almost any sensor on it. Mm -hmm. You know, we provided data communications, mechanical connections, uh, power connections. And, but for example, in the applications that we're excited about where you're, you're monitoring these factories uh, for their health, there's probably a simpler machine that we could build that's really focused on that use case. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the difference between the general purpose machine or the platform versus the purpose-built machine. And so even though, even in the factory, we'd still like the robot to do lots of different tasks, if, it's, if we really knew on day one that we we're gonna be operating in a factory with these three sensors in it, we would have it all integrated in a package that would be easier, more, less expensive, and more reliable. So we're contemplating building, you know, a next generation of that machine.